Thank you, Dr. McKinnon. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be here and speak to you. So um, I've, I have nothing to disclose, no financial disclosures. Um, so just a, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about during this um, presentation is, as I believe there's a value proposition for academic medical centers, I'll, I'll abbreviate that AMC, for performing in-house molecular genetic testing. Um, for this to be successful, it requires buy-in from all stakeholders uh, in order to develop a long-term strategic plan. They need to have a coherent vision, a solid business plan, and really importantly, scalable IT infrastructure. Now, if this is successful, um, this program can lead to really exciting innovations that ultimately will benefit all stakeholders, our patients, our physicians, our researchers, the administration, and the payers. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a case study. This is one that came during COVID. Um, it's been embellished a little bit to help with some points I wanna make in this um, lecture, but it's more or less accurate. Um, so it involves a, a patient, uh, call her Jane Smith. It's a 65 year old woman, the 45 pack year smoking history. I mean, she's been smoking a pack of cigarettes every day for the past 45 years and she continues to smoke. So during the COVID pandemic, she came in with what appeared to be like COVID-like symptoms. So she had a persistent cough, feverish, weight loss, and malaise. And she has an underlying connective tissue disorder and rheumatoid arthritis and other polyarthropathies. And for this, she's taking um, anti-inflammatory uh, medicines like aspirin, glucocorticoids, and NSAIDs. So when she comes in, uh, the physicians order uh, your basic um, tests that you need to do. They get a chest x-ray, test her for COVID, do an ESR for uh, inflammatory disease, um, and then your chemistry and other, other panels that you need to order. And they order an x-ray of her lungs, and that comes back with a big mass growing in her right lung, spreading into her mediastinum, it's biopsied, and she's diagnosed with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Okay, so a portion of this tissue has been processed and sent out to commercial reference lab where they perform whole exome next generation sequencing. Now, when the results come back of this test, they don't identify any genetic variants that can be targeted using precision medicine. So she's referred to her oncologist and begins conventional chemo radiation therapy. All right, so because she is being treated in the outpatient clinic, the um, outside reference lab bills her insurance company, which is Medicare, uh, $5,600 for this NGS test. And Medicare denies this payment. And the reason they give is that this has a large number of genes that have not been clinically validated as part of standard of care lung cancer. So, you know, the outside lab uh, elects to discount this test by 50%. So they send her an invoice for $2,800. Now, rightfully, Mrs. Smith is distressed by this bill. And her experience is that she feels this entire test was a waste of time and money because it did not change her management and her treatment was delayed while they were waiting for these tests to come back. So, you know, the team was also disappointed with the, this whole sequence of events. So this is referred to the UAB Quality Control Committee with the goal of improving test utilization and patient satisfaction. And so several important um, was determined during this review that there were several important lab tests that were not ordered when she first presented. First, a, a, a white blood cell count was not ordered, uh, which you'd think they would do because she had COVID symptoms. And due to her rheumatoid arthritis, they didn't order a rheumatoid factor test. So root cause analysis also concluded that whole exome sequencing testing is not indicated for this patient due to her history of smoking, and she would have been better off having a more targeted panel looking for actionable variants. Uh, so the committee makes two recommendations to the healthcare system. One is to implement measures to improve appropriate utilization of lab testing. And the second is to reduce the volume of send out testing to commercial labs. So looking at the root cause analysis, you can think about three major categories uh, that are demonstrated with this case. You know, there's an inefficient test utilization. And some of the reasons for this is there's so many stakeholders involved in, in caring for these complex patients. And there's different complicated workflows taking place in parallel at many different levels. And there's fundamentally an uncertainty for what is the best testing to order for these patients. Um, then there's the question of what is the test menu here at UAB adequate? And the clinician felt that it was, uh, more, better, it was more suitable for this patient to do whole exome sequencing rather than utilizing the in-house testing. 
And then did the results get back effectively in a timely manner? And then there's suboptimal leverage of the clinical data, which involves data management and costs and reimbursements. So I'd like to spend the first part of now talking about the, the test menu. Um, so th as, with this case, <clears throat> it was sent out to a, a reference lab um, that, that competes with um, the UAB lab and, and other academic medical center genetics labs. What, what these sent out labs frequently do is they're very, they have a very strong customer facing side where they come to an institution and they offer what they to call comprehensive testing. And what this fundamentally means is they offer a very large hundreds of genes gene panel, and they directly market this to the oncologist. And part of the ways to um, get buy-in for using this testing option is that the patients will not be billed if the claim is denied, and that the academic, the doctors at the Academic Medical Center have the ability to uh, enhance their own academic research by being able to access databases, centralized databases that these companies provide. And some of the issues with doing this are that pathology is typically engaged very late in this process. And this, by having these Senate labs, it puts a fairly significant strain on the pathology and lab services, because you have to develop a lot of ancillary supporting work workflows to accommodate the send out testing. In addition, there's a proliferation of vendors that are offering nearly identical products. And with each one of these vendors, your workflows have to be slightly modified. So it can become very complicated. Because these are large panels, uh, frequently a large percent of the testing that goes out to them is not large enough. There's not enough tissue for the testing to work. And this also requires pathology supervision to be able to triage these cases so that only the large cases can get sent out. And then secondly, in addition, hospitals can also receive invoices for some patients. And these are patients who are, uh, it's called the 14 day rule. They're, they're an inpatient when the testing is performed and it's part of the DRG. And lastly, the vendor is accumulating large amounts of patient data from the different academic medical centers that they service. So what it really is the benefit of these large panels? Um, they are somewhat technically challenging to, to offer. Well, the main reason that there, you need to have a large panel is because there's a, a biomarker called tumor mutation burden, and it can only be calculated by using a large panel. What tumor mutation burden, which is abbreviated as TMB is, is it's detecting the number of somatic, meaning non-inherited mutations per million bases. Um, and the reason that you do this is this is a predictive biomarker for immune checkpoint inhibitors. For example, there's an immune checkpoint inhibitor called pembrolizumab. It's used in a wide range of diseases. And the cutoff for using pembrolizumab is that you have to detect more than 10, 10 somatic mutations per megabase. Now, one of the um, issues with TMB is that it's a, it's a decent but not great biomarker for picking patients who will respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. There's patients who have, whose tumors do not have a large mutation burden who do respond. And secondly, different labs have their own way of determining TMB. Some labs only look at uh, missense and nonsense uh, mutations per, mega, per megabase, and whereas other labs will look at synonymous mutations too. So it's not standardized, but you do need to have a large panel. Uh, one of the smallest panels that, that is used to detect tumor mutation burden is by is but one offered by Foundation Medicine and that their panel at one point had 324 genes when they were reporting TMB. Another important indication for using large panels is that you can identify variants that are involved in familiar cancer syndromes. For example, BRCA1 and 2, PALB2, uh, proteins and genes involved in the mismatch repair system. Now these aren't necessarily actionable, uh, but they do provide valuable information for patient management. And another benefit of large panels is it helps to match patients to clinical trials for those trials that require a biomarker to be enrolled. So this is a table that shows the major send out labs that UAB uses. Uh, Keras right now is the major one that's uh, in fashion that most of our testing is going to. Um, some important things to note is that only one of them, foundation medicine is FDA cleared. Uh, they all have, you know, a range of genes. 250 is the lowest one for the oncotype map. Keras does whole exome sequencing. Some of them are DNA and RNA assays because they'll do uh, whole transcriptome. 
Um, others are just DNA only, um, but they have a similar tumor uh, percentage tumor requirements and more or less they are going after the same targets. So really the, the major targets that these panels have to provide is they have to identify single nucleotide variants and insertion deletions, copy number changes, fusions, TMB, which is derived from the SNV and indels, and MSI. And most large panels can do this. And there are some additional uh, offerings that may or may not be important for patient management, but they're included. And maybe, maybe in a few years, these will become more part of mainstream testing. So you know, UAB, Keras Ship, uh, became a major send out partner about a year ago and their volumes have been ramping up ever since. So looking at data for the last two quarters of 2021, this shows the different oncology groups that are sending out specimens to Keras. And it, and it makes sense, you know, colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, are the most common cancers, so they would be heavily utilized, but also um, brain tumors heavily utilize Keras because that's a complex form of testing required for the accurate diagnosis of brain tumors. You can see that over time, they quickly ramped up, and now we're sending out, on average, 39 cases per month. So this is getting close to, you know, 400, 500 cases per year. So it's a large volume. Turnaround time is around nine days uh, once the lab receives a specimen. Um, and the failure rate uh, over time is, on average, 4.4%. You know, and in some months, it's really high. It can be as high as 10%. And what this really reflects is that the UAB pathologists have implemented workflows. And Dr. Christina Nagagaluzzi did a great job setting this up and pioneering it. And they've gotten very good at determining ahead of time which cases are too small. And so this improvement over time really demonstrates the fact that the UAB pathologists are being able to triage cases and, and not send cases that will fail testing out, out to these labs. And then uh, another important thing is that the testing that some of these labs offer may not really be that much better than current gold standards. So there's a test called the Natera, uh, made by Natera, it's called the Signatera test. This is used commonly at UAB to survey patients who have colorectal cancer to predict and identify if they're going to uh, recur. And so there's a protocol for doing this that are established there by the NCC and guidelines. And they involve uh, serial imaging every uh, six months initially, I mean, every three months initially, then after a couple of years, it changes every six months, plus measuring CEA levels in the blood. So this study published in JAMA uh, just a few months ago compared the Signatera test, which is a cell-free DNA to assay that's custom designed for individual patients how does it perform to just the NCC and guidelines at detecting recurrence of colorectal cancer in a cohort of patients? And it didn't perform any better than the current guidelines. And right now we're sending 228 tests in 2021 to Natera. So it questions really the added value of even doing this. Another interesting thing is that there's two um, acts working their way through the federal government, the vital and valid acts, and they're both geared at getting F FDA authorization over lab developed tests. And so you wonder if one of the requirements for having an FDA approved test is that it does perform better than standard of care. And these large companies have invested millions and millions of dollars are unable to demonstrate that. How's that gonna affect the industry? Um, so it's, there's a lot of issues raised by the proliferation of these labs and, and the offerings that they have. One thing that we've experienced, this is an idealized flowchart of what happens when we have to get involved with the send out testing is it creates a lot of work and strain on the molecular lab. This is a flowchart showing what happens after the patho pathological diagnosis is made and it's been decided that molecular send, molecular send out testing is required. Um, every green square is a step that is directly requires a pathologist, whether it's our fellow or an attending to directly supervise. The orange are ones that can be handled by staff. And every one of these dotted lines is a potential for a delay in a case. And that depends if you have to go and find the blocks, find the slides, get recuts, everything to review it. And then ultimately it gets sent out to the reference lab. And as we saw with Keras, that adds on another nine days. So you can see how much simpler this would be if we could just perform all this testing in-house. Really the only uh, delay would just be how long it takes to actually do the test in your own lab. 
The rest of the stuff can be done very quickly. So you look at this and you're thinking, why would people want to invest so much money into these send out labs? You know, if, if, the, if you're basically betting on the fact that you get reimbursed for the testing. But the business model is much more complicated than that. As these labs, by coming to these academic medical centers and other practices, they're able to collect huge numbers of specimens and genetic results. And this will allow them to then obtain FDA approval for their test. Once you get the FDA approval, now these labs will be positioned to start billing for their services. And they'll, in the process, develop a very strong market share and become established and protected providers of lab services. But you know, there's very several issues with this model. You know, is the testing profitable? You know, reimbursements for molecular testing right now are not guaranteed. And quite frequently, as we'll show, see in a minute, the reimbursement that you get for this testing is actually below your operational cost. Furthermore, with the passage of the valid and, va and vital acts uh, requiring all molecular tests to be cleared, I think these labs are positioning themselves in, in anticipation of this so that they'll be some of the be able to kind of have a control over the market because there won't be many other options for this type of testing. So this is a comparison of the reimbursement of two similar types of tests. One is the ELIO tissue complete. This is a brand new assay that we're working to bring in house at UAB. It's an FDA approved kit that's sold by a vendor, but you run it in your own lab on specific equipment. It includes 505 genes. It is testing DNA only. And we're estimating that in the first year, once we launch this assay, we'll do 360 tests per year. So based on that number, the cost of running this test for each test would be around $2,038. But the company has worked with CMS to get guaranteed reimbursement, quote unquote guaranteed reimbursement. That's predicted to be um, uh, $2,900 per test. So it has a net margin of $878. In comparison, an, an LDT kit that is not FDA approved, uh, this we're using right here, the Thermo OPA, which we have currently in our lab, actually it, it, you get reimbursement using CPT codes less than it costs to run the test. So you're losing about $86 per test. So it really isn't much of a market if you're building a lab that's based only on your revenue stream coming from reimbursement for testing. So the opportunities that send out labs have are gearing, gearing them up and setting them up that they can potentially have a major influence on how precision medicine is practiced in the United States. By leveraging this enormous amount of data that allows them to partner with pharma and they, they could become the gateway for clinical trials. So even if you have a KRAS assay in your lab, the clinical trial may require centralized testing to enroll patients. They can dis perform discovery internally and license the data to other sources and generating uh, additional revenue streams. And they're fundamentally, in addition to being uh, molecular testing companies, they're big AI and machine learning and um, bioinformatics companies. So they're developing all kinds of tools to mine the data and enhance their offerings. So they're going to become an essential component of patient care delivery, and they stand to significantly influence how precision medicine is practiced. And right now we're focusing mainly on oncology, but the ability to expand into other areas of medicine by leveraging these informatic capabilities is there, and they're already starting to do this. So send out labs function in a way that's highly efficient, very scalable, and they're poised for diversification. They compete very much with our academic medical labs and um, really, in my mind, pose a threat to the sustainability of the molecular academic centers um, genetics labs. So given this, should we accept this vision and just start sending out all our stuff for molecular testing? Now in the short run, you can see this argument because it's cheaper, easier, more effective. Clinicians have effectively bought into this model. Um, it seems like a reasonable business proposition for a hospital to do this. But in the long run, this is, I think, a short-sighted approach. Um, Send out labs are gonna develop a very rich database with their client data. They're gonna get FDA approval, they can, and what they're really trying to do is integrate uh, with the academic medical centers, EMRs, electric med electronic medical records, and tether that and integrate that with their own database, at which point their data becomes incredibly valuable because now they'll know how the patient was treated and what the outcomes were. 
And then with the vital and valid acts coming through the pipelines that's gonna require FDA approval for all molecular testing, it's gonna really affect how what academic medical centers can bring on. We'll be somewhat, it's so expensive to get FDA approval and clearance of a lab developed test that we're gonna be dependent upon purchasing uh, kits from vendors that have already gone through the FDA approval. So until that happens, there's really a timely window of opportunity for academic medical centers to, to come in and enter this market and be a player. Now to do this, you really have to, and be do this successful, it's essential, absolutely critical that you get uh, buy-in from all the stakeholders. This includes your patients who are, want to use the in-house testing, your clinicians, including your treating physicians, your ordering physicians, and your lab professionals, and your administrators, the executives in the hospitals, the managers, and the payers, to all believe that by performing in-house testing, it's going to lead to high levels of utilization, which are required to um, make it economically viable. You're going to get higher quality outcomes and the satisfaction and value that comes with that. So the model that we are beginning to adapt at UAB to do this is, is in a phased approach. And the first phase, which, which is referring to kind of as the foundation, has two components to it. First is to have a very competitive test menu. And the second is to develop highly operation, high operational efficiencies. And by doing this, it's gonna increase the testing volume and revenue and enhance the quality and expertise. Then the second layer is once this is established is develop ways that you can actually enable the data through functional data management. And this will lead to additional revenue and value streams. And lastly, by doing this, you can catalyze innovation and sustainability. Now, UAB is one of the most highly funded institutions, uh, research institutions in America. There's so many labs that are coming up with innovative ideas. And by having a system that can do a good job at translating these, in, these innovative ideas into clinical testing and, and, and patient care, it's a great way to develop new testing and sustain this model. So spend some time now talking about efforts that are going on to make our test menu competitive and our operations more efficient. So for those people who aren't that familiar with what a molecular diagnostic workflow is, it's a very complex uh, in, in relative to most lab testing. It has several uh, phases to it. The, the first phase is a pre-analytical phase, and that's when a specimen comes in, slides are made, the diagnosis is rendered, and then there's an indication for testing. And oftentimes uh, this involves identifying on a glass slide the tumor and the normal components. It involves uh, expert staffing, including pathologists and molecular pathologists and technicians. At this point, the specimen and the material are sent to the analytical lab where uh, the testing is actually done. And in a perfect ideal world, it takes about two to four days to perform the testing. And it goes through several phases where you're extracting the DNA, doing the testing, analyzing the data, making sure the data is high quality, and then coming up with your analytical interpretation. This involves various pieces of equipment and computers that all have uh, reagent agreements and, and maintenance contracts. Then eventually, it comes to the molecular pathologist uh, for clinical interpretation and reporting. And then the data needs to be backed up and, and stored. So, um, some of the biggest challenges with this process is the fact that biopsies are getting smaller and smaller to the point that they are becoming fundamentally just diagnostic biopsies, yet the demands of testing have grown so much. So in a way, it's a perfect storm. I can stick this needle into the deepest recesses of the body and get a really good biopsy to make the diagnosis, but there's really not enough, enough material to do extensive testing. So this would be an example of an FNA with a little tiny iota of tissue here uh, on high power. You can see it, so you can clearly make the diagnosis, but it's really hard to do any additional testing after that. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, TMB has a cutoff where you need a certain number of genes. And you can look at this relationship between the size of the tissue shown here in this axis and the number of genes. And there's some threshold at which you need a certain amount of tissue in order to calculate TMB, which is a mandatory test that you have to give back to the clinicians. So you have all this tissue that, that's smaller than this cutoff at which a lab needs to be able to do 
quality testing that has enough targets so you can do standard of care therapies um, and you need to do it quickly and effectively. So this is an opportunity for labs to do to bring this testing in-house and be able to, to meet this, this demand, which the big panels can't currently test. And so uh, what we've done at UAB this year, we just launched a, a new system called the Ion Torrent Genexus NGS system. It has two components to it, a purification system and the sequencer. And it's uh, nice because it's fairly uh, semi-automated, so there's very little hands-on time. It gets all the major uh, variants that need to be detected for patient care. It has a very low input, and it's much cheaper to operate than the first generation NGS testing that we were doing at UAB. Uh, you can see that that's demonstrated here, that the tech time went from about two and a half hours down to 10 minutes. Uh, the reagents are much cheaper, and if we use our current average volumes over the last, over between 2016, 2019, we're doing around 664 tests per year. You can see this massive cost savings, plus you're getting additional targets. But the real nice thing about this is the turnaround time is just two to three days rather than um, four to 19 days. And you can work with these tiny specimens. So we're launching uh, two panels that are running on this assay. The first one is called OPA, it's used for solid tumors. It is a hotspot panel. It covers 6,600 base pairs. So even then it's 150 times too small for calculating TMB. So this is really good for, for specimens that are too small to do a large panel, or if you really don't need to know TMB and all the exotic uh, extemporaneous variants and you just really wanna be focused on the highly actionable ones. We launched it earlier this month. Uh, you can order the panel by disease, different diseases. Regardless of what's ordered, it's one panel that gets run. And we're about to launch uh, a myeloid assay. It runs uh, on bone marrow and blood. Similar have targets of DNA and RNA. And this should be launching the DNA, uh, hopefully in the second quarter of this year, and the RNA will follow after that. <clears throat> with, with these, our clinical report that we use is very similar to the send out testing. Uh, we, we describe the genetic variants and they're categorized by their pathogenicity. Uh, describe what the drug responses are based on these variants, provide details on the variants. It helps match the clinical trials and then everything else that a report needs, which includes the methodology and the reference sequence details. The nice thing is that since our reports are structured in these table formats, we can pull out this data in the structured format and populate a database that, we're, that we have. And we're, to, to date, we've populated it with essentially all the legacy UAB uh, cases that have been done since Dr. Harada set up the first NGS assay at UAB. And we're also, through some tools that the vendor we're working with has provided, able to pull in uh, vendor data. So we're working now to pull in all the Kara, Strata, and Foundation Medicine data. So we'll have a rich database in a structured format of all the NGS testing that's been done retro at, retrospectively at UAB and prospectively as we move forward and grow our testing. And this is just a real life example of the benefits of having this rapid turnaround testing. So this is a, a idealized case where a patient would come in with some type of complaint. Let's just say like the patient we had at the beginning of this talk, uh, um, fever, malaise, cough. Uh, they get a CT scan, see a, a lesion, do a biopsy. The next day, if everything was going perfect, you make a diagnosis. And then at this point, you need to do further testing. So what you could do immediately would be immunohistochemistry and FISH. And within two or three days, you could have a treatment plan. But that treatment plan is not fully informed because you also need to do your molecular testing. And this could take you know, anywhere from four to 15 days to get those results back. Furthermore, for some of this testing, the sample is just too small to do the molecular testing. So you have to potentially uh, go back, rebiopsy the patient. They may not get reimbursed for this because it's just simply being done to get more tissue and it delays treatment. So in some instances, these patients are not doing well. They may be clinically unstable. So you have to start your treatment plan before you have the opportunity to have all the fully informed decision plan. And the molecular results could come back and indicate a different treatment than what you started the patient on. And it's really you don't have the option of changing therapy once you've initiated it. So with the Genexus, you can get the molecular, the IHC, the cytogenetics, 
all around the same time and your treatment plan is much more synchronized based on all these results. And as a, so you can make better decisions and also your QNS rates greatly reduced. This, this, this assay is very uh, sensitive and works with really low samples. This is a list of cases that we had tried to sequence in our lab using our old platforms that were unable to get any result. And with essentially all of them, we were able to detect variants with that same specimen that had failed previously. Um, another very uh, exciting and really incredible platform that we have in the lab that works excellent with small samples is called the uh, Idela Biocardis. These are cartridges that are designed for specific mutations. They have incredibly low amounts of turnaround time. You simply drop a paraffin tissue into the cartridge slide this uh, door shut, load the machine, it takes about two minutes to do. And within a few hours, you get your results back. So this could give you same day uh, molecular diagnostic results because that whole workflow now is on board on this closed system. Um, where they work really well, uh, we've done a lot of analysis on, this, on these panels with different cartridges that they offer. Uh, they're very sensitive down to 1% uh, tumor in some cases. They work really well. They have great analytical sensitivity and specificity compared to gold standard methods. Um, and one of the greatest features is your turnaround time can go from eight days to two to three days. So really have, have a nice and exciting role. But what's kind of surprising is that these really haven't caught on with the clinicians. They're just not that interested in this testing. And so really they've been kind of relegated to a niche role. And that is uh, in these really tiny cases. So this is an example that we analyzed in the lab where we had 25 FFPE cases of non-small cell lung cancer that were too small to test on next generation sequencing. So we took these 25 cases and went back to the block and got some more tissue out of it. And there really began, and I'll mind you, there was very little to begin with. So these 25 cases, uh, we tested EGFR. And, and of these, we found two of them had an EGFR mutation. And then the, re the remaining samples for which we had tissue tested KRAS, found six KRAS mutations. And then the remaining 12 wild type, the ones that were, we were losing cases along the way due to dropout, we were able to test four more. So of these 25 cases, eight had an actual mutation using the idealist system, which otherwise wouldn't have been known. So then the question was, would this, okay, cool. They work well, they, it's well known that they work on small tissue but would that have changed patient care? Could that, would that have actually had any value to a clinician? So 20 of these 25 patients did a clinical follow-up. And of these 25 pa 20 patients with follow-up, 13 had to have a repeat biopsy. But had we done the initial idea in the first place, two of those 13 would not have had to have follow additional biopsies because we would have identified a target on the idea that would have influenced their therapy. So it would have saved these two patients a repeat biopsy. Now, the seven patients who did not get repeat biopsies, they just went and got conventional uh, chemo radiation. In two of them, we discovered variants that were related to EGFR that the clinician was asking about. So they would have gotten different therapy. And in a third one, we detected a mutation called KRAS G12C. At the time we did this study, there was no drug for KRAS G12C, but subsequently uh, there's an FDA approved drug. So, you know, if we'd done this, at, uh, this analysis today, it would have been an, an additional patient. So between four and five of these 20 patients, it would have changed their uh, management. So it does have an unmet need for these small QNS samples. This will give you uh, some other examples of testing that, that we're having here in the lab that's making the lab more competitive is we have a 95 uh, gene fusion panel. Uh, and the really great feature about this is that it, um, you only need to know one of the partners of the fusion gene uh, to get this to work. So we'll use EWSR1 as an example. EWSR1 is a highly uh, promiscuous fusion partner. It can, it can partner up with lots of different fusion events. Um, so it, historically, this is really challenging because you had to predict which fusion event was there and design a whole multiplex PCR assay to do that. But with the chemistry that this assay works on, it's called anchored multiplex PCR. You stick one primer uh, in your gene of interest, in this case, EWSR1. Uh, it does a reverse transcriptase reaction. It goes through the breakpoint and it starts reading into the partner gene without knowing what it is. 
And then eventually the transcription reaction falls off. You repair, in repair the, the, this uh, transcript, you put on a universal um, adapter that has a primer that since you know the sequence, you can do that primer. And then you do uh, read back in the other direction. Now you can do PCR and you capture the gene that's fused to uh, your target gene. And it really solves the problem of, of having rare fusion events or cryptic fusion events or alternative fusion events you wouldn't normally be able to detect. So this has a lot of value in the lab because first off, it really helps for identifying clinically actionable fusion variants such as like ALK ML4. And second, it's shown to be a very powerful ancillary diagnostic tool for pathologists to improve uh, diagnostic accuracy. So not only are oncologists ordering this test, but pathologists order it, particularly with salivary gland tumors and soft tissue. And so I'll show you a couple of the examples. Uh, this is a case, uh, it was recently uh, written up by our fellow Hyder Mejbel, and he got accepted in um, uh, just this past week. And this is a case of, of histologically, this looked like a low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. It's got this beautiful palisading nuclei pattern. It has areas of hypo and hypercellularity. And it stained, some of the cells stained positive for the estro estrogen receptor. So the initial treatment for this patient was an ER inhibitor called letrozole. Now, this patient had a weird behavior with their tumor that it kept recurring locally, kept having to have additional surgeries, and it was very hard to manage uh, locally. So after the second or third recurrence, it was submitted for um, sequencing, and a fusion event in this tumor uh, was detected involving MEIS1 and NCOA1. Now, this is a newly recognized group of exceedingly rare low-grade spindle cell sarcomas that often involve the genitourinary and gynecological tracts. And these tumors can mimic other types of tumors, such as what was happening here with the endometrial stromal sarcoma. But the important thing was, is there's no evidence that these will respond to ER agonist. So um, the patient was treated to doxetaxel, and when we last checked, uh, was responding. So this is really important. You change the diagnosis, and you change the therapy, and, and the patient can potentially benefit from that. This is another example showing the power of this, these assays as an ancillary tool for pathologists. This is a paper that's about to be submitted by uh, Ching Wei, a fourth year resident. Um, she looked at 135 cases that were submitted by pathologists to help with the diagnosis. So these were not submitted by oncologists. And in 35% of them, there was a fusion event. And she developed a, cat a system of different groups at which the, the fusion event was in group one, it, it actually changed the diagnosis. And 9% of the cases, the diagnosis was changed. And that's kind of very similar to the previous case where it's really important because the therapy will change potentially. Uh, second group, a large group, about 45% of the cases, the diagnosis became much more specific, which was helpful. Uh, in the third group, it, it supported the diagnosis. So it confirmed it. In the fourth group, there's we call fusions of unknown clinical significance. Uh, these are the, this means there was a fusion event detected, but we didn't know what to make of it. So very useful to run these panels for, for pathologists. And lastly, our, our large gene panels that we're developing, we have two that are bringing on, the Ilio Tissue Complete, FDA approved kit I talked about earlier. Uh, we're waiting to place a certain sequencer we need, the next seek DX in the lab. And as soon as we get that and the contracts, are all finalized. We're going to validate this and launch it. It's a very simple validation, relatively speaking. At the same time, we were previously engaged in a large uh, 500 gene panel. It's a lab developed test called GOAL. This is a, a really interesting consortium of academic labs that all decided to pool their resources and make a large group purchase from IDT that provides the hybrid capture probes. And normally this would have been like about a million dollar purchase, but the cost was spread out amongst 30 different labs, making it incredibly cheap. So we can have a low cost way of doing large panels. Yulong Fu and Layla Quick and Ryan Miller are working to develop this uh, assay and hopefully we'll get this validated uh, sometime uh, late summer, early fall. So the ELIO assay that we're excited about, which is FDA approved, is really important. It really stacks up nicely with all the send out testing that's currently going out. So <clears throat> this would be important for repatriating a lot of the send out testing and increasing our volumes in the lab. Um, 
So just to summarize where we're at, what we hope to have by 20, this should say 2022, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and this year, uh, we're gonna have our, our, our rapid testing with the Idela and the Genexus, our large panels. We already have a fusion panel. Shuko Harada is leading a team that's developing a large pharmacogenomic panel, which we're not talking about, but that's about nearly done. And then, you know, you have some interesting organ systems like CNS and lung, where in addition to the fusion and the large gene panels, you have additional testing that can't be run on the on these same workflows, like methylation assays for MLH1 and MGMT and copy number changes, such as 1P19Q and oligodendroglioma. So developing up su supporting ancillary service for these. And really to help all this operate and run smoothly, we're, we're just nearly done uh, implementing a, a new limb system called Ovation. And this is gonna be nice. It has bi-directional interfaces to the EMR and Cerner, gonna really facilitate ordering, tracking, managing all this because as we grow, it's, it's the management of all these cases is very, uh, very complex and it interfaces with our reporting software, our analysis software. So we're really excited to go live with that. So that's our test menu. Now, what do we mean about the operational efficiencies? Well, one of the big problem for any large complex academic medical center and their labs are that you have fragmented services and data. So we talked about the need to develop a competitive test menu, but you also need to have a competitive uh, operational uh, system. This really comes down to laboratory services um, and supportive services uh, to make this work well so that you're efficient and timely and cost effective. And so the way that we're approaching this at, at UAB is, is a, a new venture called the Genomic Diagnostic Laboratory. And what this represents is a joint venture amongst various stakeholders at UAB, including UAB Hospital, pathology department, pediatric department, clinical genetics, the UAB Precision Medicine Institute, Cancer Center, and Southern Research Institute. And it's, the idea here is that by, since they all of these groups have some commonalities, you know, we share workflows, we share vision and goals, you can consolidate redundant workflows in one operation, reduce your costs, but then leverage your expertise so that you're, um, just have better quality, better uh, knowledge, better interpretations, um, and, and all the things that come with that. So that's gonna target molecular microbiology, molecular oncology, pharmacogenomics, clinical genetics, and bioinformatics. And initially focusing on serving the UAB hospital, the UAB enterprise and our affiliated partners, and then over time develop an outreach network to, to get new non-UAB clients, okay? So speaking only of the clinical organization, nearly all the parts are in place. Uh, many of the medical directors have already been identified and are, uh, will participate. We're having an exciting recruitment now for uh, an informatics section. Um, so this will be really full spectrum molecular genetic testing. Um, and the value proposition of this is gonna optimize delivery of patient care. And we have a great test menu um, clinical expertise. We already have talked about our limbs and our workflows, consolidating them, integrating with the EMR and other UAV partners. And by doing this, we're going to reduce cost and, re and increase our revenue. Very exciting part about this is that looking for the long-term strategy is structuring this data in a way that it's useful and enabled for future and downstream analyses. Um, and it can work with our own data as well as data coming into us from send out labs. And that's gonna support the potential for innovation. So this, I know we have about 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna talk about the rest about the, the GDL and, and give you an update and where we're going with that and what its status is. And then finalize uh, the talk with what, how this can all support the long-term strategy of innovation. So the molecular and genetic testing is an expanding uh, business. We worked with, um, some consultants from a company called Acumen to help us develop a business plan to make sure that, the, to, to see, does this GDL make sense from a business point of view? And I, I actually think that was a really good idea that we did first, although I don't think we realized at the time is by having the business analysis first, all the stakeholders would become interested. Whereas if we had had a mission analysis first or, or a vision, then you know certain stakeholders would be have been less engaged. And there's a, a rapid, 11% growth year over year of the molecular testing market. It's estimated that in the Southeast, the market's around $200 million. 
And UAB is around three and a half percent of this market because we're referring $7 million annually in molecular testing. And this growth is driven by our population and our aging, and that's aging, uh, by the rapidly increasing number of therapies that are biomarker driven. And the fact that clinical trials are very important to academic medical centers and represent a source of revenue uh, for recruiting patients for. At the same time that there's growth, the actual cost of doing a molecular test is getting lower and lower. So if you just look at this chart showing the cost of goods sold, and goods sold, what that means is if you were to take all the molecular testing that a lab does and just average, what's well, the average cost of your molecular test? Knowing that some are much cheaper, some are most expensive, but your average cost of your molecular lab and your average molecular laboratory is now in 2020, $225. So it's shown like a five-fold decrease over the last five years. And at some point, it's just going to become uh, flat, and it's about as cheap as it'll get until technology changes. And we've seen this growth at UAB. This is comparing 2020 to 2021 growth. And of course, a huge amount of growth happened with COVID testing. But when you tease out the, the, the COVID testing, just look at the non-COVID testing, you can see in almost every major category of laboratory testing, a large increase in our volume. And we anticipate that this will continue to grow. And where we're not seeing that growth is in our solid tumor testing. The reason for that is it's getting sent out. We have 1,253 molecular oncology tests that were sent out in 2021 with Keras Foundation Medicine and Natera representing the vast majority of these. So as we had talked previously about, the reason for this is our test menu is just non-competitive, but hopefully by the end of the year, it'll be competitive and we can see a reversal and repatriation, a lot of this testing. And this <clears throat> just shows what this will do for the institution. Right now, about $5.8 million in testing is performed in-house. And we're losing uh, 7.1 million by, by being sent out to reference labs, either directly by the hospital or by directly by physicians that could easily be repatriated once we get our test menu um, up to speed. So just the, the, the market for this growth is our own patients. So it's not like we have to hire salespeople and go out and get this business. It's already here. You just have to recapture it. And ultimately, by getting some new equipment, you could carve back another 1 million and send out testing. So between all of this, it represents in about two to five years, going from 5.8 million in testing to around $14 million in testing. So it kind of could pay for itself relatively quickly. The pro forma that was performed estimated that in five years, the revenues will pay for itself and we'll have the break-even point where you'll no longer be running a deficit. And it's also estimated that the cost of doing this venture would be around $25 million with 13 of that being a, a new facility. So where are we? And so this is an idea right now. This sounds great. We've done our business analysis. Looks good. So what? You know, is this really going to happen or not? So you know, this whole idea has been kicking around since before Dr. Neto came, but when he arrived in 2016, he was determined to get this up and running. So he, he, he set forth to get the traction, to, to, to get the, the wheels turning, to, to make this a reality. And when I, he, when I came here in 2019, he charged me with coming up with a plan to help get uh, approval to actually, what, how are we going to get this off the ground and, and approved? So that's when we decided to engage with consultants uh, right before COVID started to do our financial market analysis. And then uh, about a year ago, maybe a little less than a year ago, we presented this to the financial assessment to the UAB hospital and uh, the health system CFOs, and they liked it. So we got kicked up to leadership uh, at UAB. And um, in, in August of last year, we gave the, the vision, the financials, plans of UAB senior leadership. Uh, they gave a favorable response. And then just this past winter, all the key stakeholders agreed to contribute funding to the GDL, which was a huge milestone. So at present, what's happening now are the lawyers are determining the final legal governance, equity, and organizational structures for the GDL. Basically, who's kicking in what? Who's going to own what? Where will the revenues go? And so while that's taking place, uh, we're anticipating that at the fourth quarter of 2022, sometime in September, hopefully, uh, the final UAB approval will happen. And then we get the, we're on, it's gonna happen. And then that, at that point, uh, engage the architects and start working. So the likely site that this 
G, the GDL will live, will be on the, uh, this, in this area here, it's adjacent to the Southern Research Campus. It's on University Avenue uh, and flanked by 22nd, 23rd Street. They'll lock, knock down this building and engage an architecture company, the manufacturing company in Bessemer called Blocks. They do prefab uh, construction on site and then truck the parts of the building to the site and construct it. So it takes you know a multi-year building project and consolidates it down into like nine to 12 months. So it'd be really amazing. Plus the building's designed intelligently because uh, they're integrating architecture and construction. So it's a really exciting project to do this. And it really fulfills Dr. Watt's vision of having the south side of Birmingham be this future biotech corridor at which the GDL will be in the center of that. So it's a great location. Um, so now to finish up, talk about our functional data management. Um, as we all know that there's so much data to improve patient care is out there, but it's neither usable or available because it's in different silos. So one of our large strategies is to address this by putting the data into structured databases where it can be linked up with other databases and become enabled. So if you think about an idealized pathway through patient testing, there's several parts to it. First, the ordering. And the first case we talked about today, there's issues like, how do I order? What's the best test? So you can use data to help influence a clinician to make the right, to select the right test. You do this several ways. You can use AI and machine learning to look at the, some of the major demographics of the patient to help steer them towards testing. Secondly, you can have a test formulary where you identify that, hey, this testing can be performed at UAB. So I'm not even gonna give people the option to, to send it out when it can be the, the appropriate testing can be done in-house. And then once the testing is done, you can have ways to integrate this testing with the limbs. This can send the results back and get quicker turnaround time. And then you have all these operational metrics that you can analyze to improve your operational efficiencies. Once the data is out there, it can be used to really help do precision decision. I got this mutation, I have this patient, what is the best way to treat this patient? And this can land in the MD's workflow and be right at his fingertips in the EMR rather than some scan document that's attached to the medical report is not very accessible. Plus it's in a structured database where it can be exported and, and ultimately integrated with the EMR. And then there's uh, further analysis you can do. You can automatically kick cases into the tumor board queue when, when it's necessary to get additional uh, uh, expertise reviewing it. So to do this, you have to have a harmonized ecosystem where all the informatics are supporting every step of this uh, testing and treatment odyssey. It also will support research and operations. And the way this will be done is through structured data. So the plan for this, and working with a company called Genome Oncology that is pioneering this, this strategy, is at the very center of it is our UAB Precision Oncology Platform. And what this will, will do is it'll allow data management and enablement. So we'll have several components to it. Genetic data, clinical data, clinical knowledge, meaning what is a KRAS mutation? What is an EGFR mutation? And it'll all be in a structured format. So what is the source of this data? Well, that's gonna come from two ways. One is after patient gets diagnosed and they're going their testing, we can either do it in-house in the GDL and through our own pipelines, it'll populate this in real time. The other way is using software and partials. We can pull in this data also from reference labs. So it'll all live in this database in a structured format. Then through our partners using uh, different interfaces, you could potentially, and I'm sure there's different ways to do this, but one, just as an example, pulling in the clinical variables for these same patients, using tokens to match them up. You can pull in the clinical data and integrate it with the genetic data. This could then lead to various interfaces that can be used. Everything from precision decision support tools, tumor boards, just people who wanna mine the databases to look at analytics. And then for programmers who can write their own APIs, you can get into here and, and write your own scripts to study the data. And then what that will lead to are insights. You will optimize your patient therapy through trials and therapies. You can have peer reviewed uh, recommendations patient cohort discovery through dashboards, institutional insights, clinical data integration. I think this is really important because that can lead to treatments and outcomes, and lastly, research. And so it'd be great 
if academic medical centers, we could partner with them because they all have the same uh, um, challenges that we have, the same competitive pressure from these vendor labs, is that you could have a centralized database. And the fact that the data can be done generated from the lab or from a third party vendor, you can centralize it and then integrate it with different EMRs. So you can have a large network of academic medical centers in the region uh, to leverage this data and, and derive value from it. We've already had some very preliminary conversations with LSU Shreveport, who, who likes this idea and is interested in pursuing it further. So the, then this is kind of a long-term plan. There's nothing to actually demonstrate that this is working yet, but it's a, a vision where we could pilot this with, with a, a willing partner, show that it works, show that it has done value, and then and, and enlist other academic centers who may be interested in participating in this. So I wanna finish up. I know we're getting really close. I apologize if, if this is taking longer than I thought. Uh, innovation and sustainability. So I don't know if you all have read this book, Loon Shots. It's really amazing. I, I loved it. Uh, great book. And what they talk about is how is it so hard for, act, for places, any institution that wants to innovate, but is unable to do it. And, they, and, the, and the concept of this book is that they're just not designed. They're structurally not designed to promote innovation. You can think about it at UAB. We have the researchers. These are, this is where the creative ideas come great ideas out of research labs. And you can think of them as a very fluid culture where ideas can go back and forth like water. But then you get over into the clinical side and because you have to maintain patient safety, you have to be maintain consistency. You have to be SOP protocol driven. They're very rigid. And so they cannibalize good ideas because it's not the environment at which an idea can be translated and adopted. So innovation does not work in these types of models. So we can just kind of squeeze the GDL in between these two. We're kind of at that ice water interface and allow you to explore these great ideas and exploit this rigid uh, structure of, of, a, of a lab to promote innovation. And so you can think about all the things you can innovate with, with reagents and technologies, data analysis, AI algorithms, instrumentation, drug delivery systems, all the stuff our partners at SR have, all our stuff that are UAB School of Medicine and our researchers and in the hospital. So it's really an exciting opportunity, but the, the GDL would need to be designed to accommodate this. So you have to have the ability to, to most clinical labs don't have an R&D component to them. So you build an R&D component in it, and then you have leadership that wants to do this. They want to bring these ideas in and find the winners and implement them. And th from this innovation and sustainability will come. You can imagine just right off the bat, two really good ways that this could happen is you could imagine supporting the research arms of clinical trials. This is a win-win for everybody because a clinical trial may be focusing on circulating DNA in the blood. The lab wants to bring on that technology. You could step in, be the lab for that clinical trial to, to study the remainder of the tissue, develop a new technology, and then now you have a new test in your lab. So I think that's the last slide and I really appreciate your patience. Um, so the, the, I believe there is value for investing in in-house testing. Yeah, academic medical centers have unique competitive advantages. Mainly we have access to the clinical and data outcomes. We have high quality due to the proximity of our clinicians, faster turnaround times, very strong safety programs, and we can foster innovative culture to develop new products and advanced medicines. We have a different business model one thing we have in common with Sendout Labs is that we can form partnerships with pharma to analyze our genetic data, but we have all these other missions that we can fulfill. We can support the academic research by supporting grants and contracts, tap into our own research and develop new technologies, and promote commercialization of these new, uh, these new developments. And then we are much better aligned at serving our own mission, our own population, and our own state taxpayers, uh, whereas I think uh, Sendout Labs do not share that mission. So thank you so much. I'm sorry it took so long. I meant to be done much sooner. Um, Got to thank the pathology team, Dr. Neto, uh, great boss and a wonderful team here, the Southern Research, the genetics department, uh, the cancer center, our hospital lab. Uh, here's some of the people that are in the molecular lab. And so if there's any time, I'll be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. McKinnon. We're right at 101, but I think we can take a couple questions. Um, it doesn't hurt to go over just for a few minutes, I guess. There's one in the chat by Randy Cron. He talks about Invite and the 450 plus exome gene panel for about $900 takes about two weeks. 
and um, he says he's been using it and uh, wants to know if that's something that we offer at UAB. You know, right now we don't offer that. And I think this would be something where <clears throat> you have to do a business case. It is, is a service, like for certain things, especially germline, I've been talking a lot about oncology. That's much more complicated for doing large panels because of, for various reasons. Germline is, is much more of a commodity at this point. So I would say this, one, you'd have to look at the volume and see, could you beat that price? If you can't, is there an advantage for paying more to do it in-house? But if the answer to both of those questions is no, there's no reason you couldn't send it out, but then have it in your contract with that vendor, they return the raw data to us. And we still put that into our databases. So we have access to that component of it. So I think you want to have a model where it's not dependent upon doing the testing in-house. It's getting the data back in-house in a format that you can structure. So I hope, I don't know if that answered the question or was a, a useful comment, but that, that's my take on it. Okay, now I'll leave it up for one or two more questions maybe if anybody has anything pressing or about 103 now. So a little bit over time, we usually quit. Okay, if not, thanks a lot, Dr. McKinnon. Really appreciate your lecture. A little bit of insight into what's happening here at UAB. Um, it's really good information. Appreciate your time. Sure, thank you very much.